one piece of advice from each of you that you wish you would have gotten when you were here in that seat? Go to class. <laughs> <laughs> First, I would like to introduce to you the CEO of the Spring Hill Company, Maverick Carter, and Chief Brand Officer and the co-creator of the shop, Paul Rivera. Hampton, what's up? Hampton, what up, what up, what up? So now it's time to bring out our special guest. And the beauty of it all is that they all attended Hampton University. First up... We have the president of MSNBC and my soror, Miss Rashida Jones. <laughs> Next up, we have Dreamsville's own Grammy nominated boss. <laughs> and last but not least, we have former Little League baseball pitcher and probably one of the fastest, Miss Monet Davis. Um. So I figured Mav and I were just talking back. The, the, the right place to start. We are on campus at Hampton. At Hampton. Welcome. Thank you. Thank uh, you guys for having thank us. You. Beautiful campus. Beautiful people. Um, but not just on campus. Homecoming weekend. Tell us a little bit from Mav and I, like what your experience is. Let's let's call it your freshman year, Hampton homecoming. I would have been here anyway. I think. It's like a family reunion that you just can't describe. It's that moment for those couple of days where it used to be two and a half days, now it's three and a half, maybe four days, um, where you just, it's family and you get to be your 17 or 18 year old version of yourself. You get to remember what it was like to sit in Ogden and walk the yard and maybe step on the, the grass outside of Ogden, but you just get to go back to like who you were before life took you on whatever journey. It's the family reunion, it's the fellowship, it's the, it's the love. And I think it's that very brief moment for me where I get to kind of be away from all of the other stuff and just go back to basics. For me, when I recall my earliest homecoming experiences, it was, you know, growing up in New York, I had never experienced anything like that. It was a real, you know, cultural awakening. First year as an alum, so just gonna ex just love it, experience it and just have fun. That's right, you just graduated like yesterday. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats to you, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Uh, for all of you guys, though, when you got here in Hampton, did anything like what were your dreams and aspirations? And did being here change them? Or did, it, did you walk in wanting to be something and you, and you stuck with it? I think for me, like I knew I wanted to be a journalist, but I didn't know how real it was and how possible it was until I got here. And, and I think that's one of the things that I always tell people. Like one of my takeaways was coming here, you really understood the impossible as possible. I mean, I would even go back to when I was covering you. Like, I remember when you were in the World Series and was like, oh my God, like, this is the, the lead story of the night. Then it was, oh snap, she's going to Hampton. I mean, like, just the fact that, that like, real life happens here. And one of the things they teach you, even sitting here in Ogden Hall, one of the things they would teach us is, Anything is possible. You can do anything your counterparts can do. Dream big and then dream bigger and then cross that out and dream bigger than that. And, and for me, like, that was, liberating because I didn't think that big. I didn't dream that big. I got my first opportunities to work in the industry while I was here. And it's not necessarily something I would have felt confident to do um, in a place that didn't foster that, that, that kind of um, philosophy. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I was, you know, I did, I did well in high school in chemistry because I just had this teacher that like, would like curse at me. And <laughs> like, he was like one of the guys, you know, so I just took to his class and then, I ended up getting a scholarship to come study pharmacy here. Oh, wow. um, and, you know, I didn't know at the time that I was a creative, you know, so, but it just, it didn't stick with me personally. But I did come down here, you know, I met my boy Maddie, who's, you know, part of my management. He's a, he's a pillar of Dreamville, like a day one guy when we started the record label. You know, I linked uh, with my boy Tay James, who, who now DJs for Justin Bieber. He was doing like the 12 to 2 in the student center. And, and so I was, you know, I was kind of developing like all these creative links with people now that I think about it in retrospect. And, you know, that kind of all started here. So, no, I, I didn't know I didn't know what I what I wanted to do. I actually really tip my hat to anyone who's 18 and, and has that figured out. How about you? Obviously, you're an athlete, came with, but you wanted to do other things. Did you kind of know what you want to do and had your dreams and aspirations figured out? 
Yeah, I did. So um, high school, I decided I want to be a journalist. I wanted to interview athletes. And then summer before I got here, I got to do the kids cast with ESPN and talk just Little League World Series. And then once I got here, just kind of wanted to perfect that craft. And I feel like once like my senior year came, I realized I wanted something bigger, I wanted something more. And that's why I'm in grad school now, studying sports management to achieve those bigger dreams. Because Say sports management? Yes. So at, just, Columbia. <laughs> at Columbia. At Columbia. At Columbia. And, but, but this summer you interned. By, by the way, we may know someone. I was going to say, I think you guys know sports. sports <laughs> in that space. Right. I'm trying to get you a job. You, um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you interned for the Dodgers this summer? Yes. And now you're, are you thinking about doing something different besides journalism? Are you thinking about working for a team? Talk to us about that, what you want to do next. Yeah, so I did production with the Dodgers. So I was editing all the, you know, highlight videos that go on the big screen. But now I want to I want to own a team, a women's team in Philly. So bring soccer and basketball there. When you guys, like, all of you are very well accomplished, but still have so much more to do, and I think about this sometimes in my own career, in my own life, um, waking up and, and for students and things, to, to that idea of like, yes, I know what I want to be. I know I, you like, you dead set on your Grammy winner, ma making amazing music, obviously running a huge network. Do you ever think about pursuing two goals at the same time or is it all in on one? I always have five, 10 things in my head that I want to do. Um, and I think part of that is because my whole like focus isn't just like, what's my professional path, right? It's what do I want to do in life? What do I want to do um, to, to give back to other people? What do I want to do as a mother? What do I want, what do I want to do as a wife? What do I, like, like I, I'm constantly thinking about, and, and sometimes it can, it can be overwhelming. Here's where I am. And then how do I want to advance that on a different level? But, but I'm pretty consistent and not wanting my goals to only be professional goals. You know, like that's one part of who you are. That's one part of your dynamic. And I think it's important, you know, to tap into all sides of kind of who you are in your life. Because if it's just like I have one career goal and that's all I'm focused towards, I just think it it, it, it limits you and, and you may be missing out on some passions that um, that are worth exercising. Yeah, I think for me, um, music's been an incredible platform as, as far as just, you know, helping me you know, diversify my business or, and travel and see the world and make all these connections. But as far as the craft of being in the studio and songwriting, like that's, you know, it's never felt like work. It's never felt like business. So that part of it, I still feel like a very strong discipline to, and like, you know, I still want to get better. I mean, it's probably akin to like an athlete, you know, practicing or, or, or doing what you got to do, you know, behind the scenes to, to be the best at your craft. So that part never goes away. Mom. I don't know yet because I'm still <laughs> I'm still in college, so I'm worried That's about awesome. getting assignments done. I got finance due on Tuesday, so I'm I'm not sure yet. Maybe we'll come back to it in a couple years, though. She just called us old, in case you weren't sure. Not a thing. I take that as a badge of honor. <laughs> um, Boz, you mentioned you know your sound, um, and in doing a little bit of research on you, uh, Sudanese parents, born in Paris, moved to Queens. How did that influence your sound, if at all? Yeah, and, I, you know, I also have four older siblings, so I was just getting everything passed down from, like, traditional Sudanese music to, you know, French house and you know, UK garage, and then obviously, you know, Nas, you know, Pac, Big, Hove, all the East Coast legends. Um, I was just a sponge, you know, and then also I think more so with songwriting, when you, when you travel as much as, as we did growing up and you're dealing with people from all different walks of life, it really helps you identify, you know, certain themes to write about, certain things that are relatable. You start to see kind of like this, this link between all humans really in general. Like people have the same aspirations, goals, you know, plans, whatever the case may be. And you, you kind of get to use that then to, you know, to write that into your songs. Rashida, in 2023, what is news, A? And B, is news, I'm going to use a word, is it meant to be entertaining or is it just meant to deliver messages to us? So I'll start with the second part of that question. And I think it's, it's, um, 
some of it is reflective of the times that we're in. Is it supposed to be entertaining? Um, I think our purpose is to inform, not necessarily to entertain. If I was programming an entertainment network, the lineup would be very different from a news network. You know, I think the times that we're in right now are complicated times. You know, in a moment where, you know, half of my inbox is about developments and uh, about a war in the Middle East, the other half is about developments and a mass shooting in Maine. Um, it's a dark time. And so our job is not only to make sure we're giving you the broccoli along with the steak, we're giving you what you need in addition to what you want. But I think our job as journalists is to make sure we're bringing it to you in a way that's digestible, in a way that's relatable. You know, um, we I, I run a brand. And so that brand consists of a cable channel that you might turn to on your TV. It could consist of a website where you can go find and read information. It could be a, a TikTok with um, our informed uh, information about a topic that you're interested in. I think in 2023, what news is has evolved. We're in more places um, bringing information that's important, that's relevant, that's credible, but bringing it to you in a way that you can digest. And I think um, it's particularly difficult right now because the topics are heavy. So I, I'm always cognizant of not only what do you need to know, but what's the best way to get it to you. Can I ask her a follow-up to that? Please. Yeah, yeah, this is the shot. It's the journalist. This is a shop. We all chopping it up. <laughs> yeah, I really wonder lately, like, it seems like with social media and all these, like, you know, unvetted sources, there's so much misinformation out there. Sources. Yeah. Even when those things get debunked, there's, like, enough time that passes where, like, really bad stuff happens. And then there's really no, you know, there's no fallout after there's no yeah. accountability anywhere. And it's like, I, I was reading this interview and it's one of the guys that like helped Google develop their AI and he quit. And he's like, uh, he's like, I regret my life's work because he's, yeah. he's like, I see a future where no one will know if an image is real, if an audio recording is real. You know what I mean? I'm like, how do you guys deal with that in news? So it's tough. And I think there are two paths you can take. One is, you know, the world is trash. Social media is trash. Let me get out of it and keep my brand away from it. Right. And so that's one path. Our approach is there's a lot of disinformation out there. And rather than leave it to the amateur, so to speak, to put that information, I want to make sure if you're consuming on Snap, TikTok, Twitter, X, whatever, that we are a credible voice and a credible source for that information, right? So, so I'm not going to change the amount of content that's out there. I'm not going to change the amount of disinformation. I'm not going to be able to change all of that. What I can do and what I have control over is making sure that we have the right information out there. We have the right perspective. I mean, I'm going to even take it a step further, that the, the voices that are representative of all of our communities are a part of that conversation. I feel like that's my calling. And you brought up AI, and this is a conversation we have in, in my house a lot, is, you know, as a, as a performer, as a musician, is, is in our space, well, a lot of the concern is about disinformation. But in your space, it's basically taking what you do and yeah, replicating they're trying to get it. us out of here. Right. But like, how do you how do you take that on? Um, I think in, in our field, honestly, I think we're being a little paranoid. I think AI is actually going to help. Oh, interesting. I think you don't hear a lot of people saying that. You don't. Yeah. But when you sit in the studio and and you see how much time is spent doing like kind of like remedial tasks that you kind of wish you had a, a little AI buddy to take over. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to those days. I don't know. I think so much about creating music is, is you know, I feel like it's about the human experience. You know, I don't think that, I mean, I guess maybe if it studies us enough and maybe it could replicate that, but, you know, writing about a lost loved one or, you know, or heartbreak, like, I don't know if AI will be able to do that. Yeah, I I was having this topic the other night. I mean, this conversation the other night at dinner. My point was, the train has left the station, so you it's pointless to go. Oh, I'm fighting it. I'm this. You got to actually adapt and learn. That's how the world works, right? The world goes forward always. Humans go forward. Things go forward. So as people who run companies, we're having a discussion. Like if you're sitting there going like, ah, I'm not dealing. No, you actually should learn how it helps you. The record label. The, they the train has MP3s. left the station. They yeah. tried to fight MP3s and almost went bankrupt till you know Steve Jobs exactly. brought iTunes around. They like, fought it for so long. It was right. a silly. You can't idea. fight tech. Yes. I do want to double click a little bit on the question you asked Rashida for you, Buzz. Um, you just dropped a single, what, two days ago, three days ago? I was just listening to in the back. Congrats on that. Thank you. Um, it felt um really timely, right? The subject matter. Um, how do you balance out like responsibility of a message and education and all that and entertainment, right? Similar to Herbert in a different way. Yeah, I mean, this one hits so close to home. Um, obviously, my 
my native Sudan since April. There's been a, a really brutal conflict pretty much between the military and a rebel militia. They're like fighting for the country, uh, but in the capital, you know, so so like my, my dad's childhood, childhood home got bombed in an airstrike. It's gone. My mom's crib where we spend every December yearly, my parents made it a point to take us back home, like from when we were kids, you know, just to keep us in touch. Um, you know, that house is gone. Um, so, so, you know, we lost a lot and we have a lot of family um, that are now like refugees in Egypt. So, it's, you know, it's a stressful time and it's especially stressful on our elders. So it just felt like I did a song a month ago um, and I had a whole different rollout single planned and everything, but I just had this feeling like, man, I got to get this off my chest and I got to try to shine some light on, on the situation where, you know, there seems to be very little people talking about it. It's the, it's the largest displacement on earth now. I think it's over 5 million people uh, are displaced, you know? So um, it's, it's tough because we're in a day and age where everything is so like metric driven with music. You know, you go on the labels and it's like, if it ain't streaming like this, then, you know, we're not clearing this budget. If it ain't doing, you know, these numbers, then, you know, these numbers won't come this way. But it's like, you know, some things I like to think have to be purpose driven, you know, especially with art. Um, you can't just always look at the numbers or how the single's gonna, you know, perform. If it means something to you, then, you know, you just kind of got to go with your heart. And was, was that song hard to write or easy to write? Did you know, it just I, start I coming? I cried or like hard? a baby writing that song straight up. And I don't, that's the only time really ever. I think twice in, my, in, in all my life songwriting, once I got, I wrote a song about my aunt after she passed, I was like in 2014. And then, and then this one, um, it was, it was a lot of like, you know, just trauma we had been carrying around for months as, as a community, you know? I had, I had, I'm having phone conversations with cousins that are like, yo, it took us like three days to get out the country, you know what I mean? Like, and, and all the, all the hard stories there, like relating to me, you know what I mean? And it's like, you're hearing this all, all this time. And then when you come and you sit to write about it and get those thoughts out, it's like, when you're actually coping with it, you know? So, yeah, it was definitely a rush of emotion. For gotcha. sure. Mo, I wanted to ask you, 13, you're on the cover of Sports Illustrated, all right? At 14, you win an ESPY. At 18, you're broadcasting on ESPN. Um, wow. Those are life That's goals. Insane. <laughs> That's insane. That's insane. Yeah, let's get right That's out. That's unbelievable. I, I, I think for... Any individual, any one of those is a life milestone, right? You, you earned those. I use the word earned purposely um, at a very young age. What has kept you motivated to keep going and trying to figure out the next thing and chase whatever the dream may be and not feel satisfied, I should say? Uh, I'd probably say just knowing your purpose. Um, I feel like all those have been great. I'm very fortunate to accomplish a lot of that, but... I feel like there's always been something inside of me that's like there's something bigger that I have to do. And it's just like taking little steps to, find, to try to find that. So growing up being an athlete, there weren't many, there wasn't a WNBA team in Philly. So like I, as a little girl, I don't have anyone to really look up to in that city. Um, so I feel like that was like my, my purpose was just to just get the attention women athletes deserve and bring that to the city that I'm from and have other little girls that have grown up like me, have them have a path that they can, you know, go down. So I feel like just knowing your purpose and just working towards it and just grinding, really. When you arrived at Hampton, you had already experienced a lot. And you talked about purpose earlier. Um, how, if you have, I don't know if you... If you have found it, how did you find it? And how did you even know it was time to start searching for a purpose? Like, how did you even arrive there? Uh, just experiencing things, trying different things out. Um, I, like I said, I did a, pro, a production internship this summer, and I don't want to do production, but it was something that I needed to do to check it off the list. Um, so just taking those little steps to just trial and error. And then also just, it's just something inside of me that I was like, I need to do something more. Like broadcasting, I love doing it. I love talking about sports, but I'm like, there's something else that I want to do and trying to figure that out. And with how big of a fan I am of women's sports, I'm like, I want to bring a sports team to, to Philly. And like you said earlier, like no dream is too big. Nothing's ever impossible. So just reaching for that and taking the necessary steps to, to do it. And being in New York City, it's 
probably the mecca of everything, really. So having so many different, you know, networking opportunities to go to and just building my network to try to make my dream come true. But to go out of your comfort zone, like, you know, women's sports, you know, sports, period, to go out of the production side of that, which is a logical path. And even for you to start with, you said chemistry, yeah. from chemistry to, to the creative side, like just the bravery that it takes to know a path that's a known entity and decide to pivot it, I think is just really impressive. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here and a little lost in the conversation in a good way. Um, when Mav and I and the team, some of which are here, um, first started having the conversation about taking the shop, you know, on the road, uh, what we first established was that we wanted it to be exactly this, like real conversation, right? Real things that people can take away with them. Um, that quickly landed us that we want to do HBCU first, right? Um, be around folks that look like us, come from where we come from. Um, the beauty of this for me is like, we literally have such a diverse group up here, of journalists, you know, musicians, maybe the next president of the United States, you know, who knows? <laughs> you could be whatever you want to be, right? That's, that's clear. Um, and you've walked the same, you know, you know, walking paths that a lot of these people, a lot of these students in the crowd have walked and ate in the same calves and dorms and all of those things. Is there any advice um, that you could give them that they could apply today? I mean, the first thing I would say is find a mentor, find your North Star, find a person um, who can guide you on your path and, and give you advice and whether it's positive or constructive, um, but find someone who can help you. For me... And I've can had, that person... Yeah. Does, does that person have to be really close to you? Could it be, when you say North Star, could it be someone you're aspiring to be? I think it can be both. I think there are people that you should have that you can call up and say, what do you think about this? Or I'm considering this pivot or I'm considering this path. And then you should have identified people who you look up to and, I, you know, I, I, I want a... Um, a path like this person or an opportunity. And with no absolutes, what you don't want to do is say, that person has that job, I only want that job because you want to give yourself the space and flexibility. But I do think both are important. You know, I, when, I, when I started here um, at Hampton, I, had, I didn't realize at the time she was going to be a mentor, um, but I had a, 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 a woman who was a, journal, a local journalist, her name was Barbara Sierra, she just announced that she's retiring. And she was finishing her degree here when I was starting my degree. So she was much older. I was, I was 17 years old. And she became my North Star because she was already a journalist. She was already in the field. Fast forward to her helping me get my first job. Fast forward to me celebrating her retirement after being in the, in the business for decades. You have to have those people who ground you and who are going to be your, your guide and can help you say, like, maybe more of this, less of that, or you're not focused, or let me help you. Um, and people who do it from a place of love. And I think the flip of that is also you have to be that for somebody else. I guarantee you for, for all of us, for any one of us, there are dozens of people who would like to take the path that you're taking. And I think as much as you're looking for finding that person that's gonna help you be the guide, the way the universe works, you have to be the guide for somebody else and that's what's gonna put you on your way. Buzz? Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I, I would not be here if, if I didn't have mentorship in music and you know, guys that put in their 10,000 hours uh, really kind of sped up my process as far as artist development. But I'll also say, like, you know, don't follow my path. I was only here for a year. I didn't apply myself as I should have. You can I'll come back. That, I'll say that off rip. <laughs> but, but I will say, you know, also, as much as I, I obviously, you got to apply yourself. Um, if, if you hit a rough patch, if you find yourself kind of treading water, um, you know, don't get too down on yourself. Like, you're so young. I didn't even realize how, you know, how young I was when I was going through those things and kind of feeling directionless in life, you know? Um, it's, it's tough at a young age when, you know, you're, you're spending all this money to go to school and you got to get your credits and you got to know everything you want to do for the rest of your life. It's, it's, it's a tough, like, mountain to climb. So, you know, if you do find yourself a little overwhelmed, like, just give it a, give it a good little woosah. You know what I mean? And just and just chill. Like just just remember like you you're young, you have your whole life ahead of you. You can figure this out. I feel like for me, coming from an HBC to a PWI, like that was a huge like shock to me. Um sitting in rooms where sometimes I might be the only black woman there, just black person in general. So and then also it kind of my confidence wasn't as high. I felt like at some point I felt like I didn't belong there, but then realizing what my HBCU provided me and they gave me all the necessary tools to 
strive in those atmospheres. So really just uh, just appreciating everything you have here, taking advantage of everything you have, networking, because that can definitely take you a long way, and just having mentors, really. I think mentors is definitely one of the, the biggest things. One piece of advice from each of you that you wish you would have gotten when you were here in that seat. Go to class. <laughs> That's that's straight to the probably, point. Probably the most important one. Bo? I'd probably say get out of your comfort zone a little sooner. Although I spent most of my college career online because of COVID, but just putting myself out there more. Um, I feel like my senior year I did it, but it's it's the end now. So just, just putting myself out, getting out of the comfort zone and just exploring really that way, building more, a bigger network and just experiencing college with some of possibly your best friends. Rashida, one piece of advice. I think just simply said is dream bigger. Whatever you think you can do, wherever you think the limits are, dream bigger than that. I remember one of my first big internships when I was here, um, I got an internship for the, uh, to work for the NBA. I thought it was fake. Like I, I applied, I knew, you know, I was, it was many, one of many applications that I sent out. And again, this is analog. So I got the letter back saying like, congratulations, we want you to move to New York for the summer. And, and I was just like, there's no way. Like there, what's the catch? Because I didn't think something like that was possible for somebody like me, especially an HBCU student. And um, I wish I would have shot further, thought bigger, but it's never too late to make that correction. That's awesome. Love it. Love it. With that, we want to thank you guys for coming. Appreciate you guys for coming. 